challenge you guys a little bit, <clears throat> maybe to uh, consider how you spend your day, how you spend your time, uh, and hopefully get us kind of uh, some juices flowing as we uh, provide the Avatar team a little bit of feedback um, uh, this afternoon. So uh, not knowing uh, that we were going to kind of do the full-blown uh, introductions uh, this morning, let me give you just a little bit of perspective. So um, I actually think I am, and I've now sort of come, you know, full circle and come clean with that as far as uh, an innovator uh, over the years, and I can give you some sense of that through the different um, things I've done in my career. But more importantly, I think it's all about this concept of what I talk about as a, as a catalyst, a catalyst to information. I have not, uh, in the many things I've done, always been the innovator per, uh, per se, but really helping kind of enable or create some of that innovation to come to life in some of the companies I've worked with uh, and, uh, and some uh, other kinds of activities and capabilities that I um, do today. So as I said, um, one of the attributes we'll talk a little bit about in uh, a book that you have, and I believe that's actually loaded on the iPad now, is uh, Innovator's DNA. Absolutely. Then they, um, what's it called? The uh, iBooks. Thank you. So um, we're going to use that as a little bit of a background. Uh, have any of you actually read the book yet? It's phenomenal. Clay Christensen, uh, primary on it, two additional authors that you probably haven't heard about as much. Um, but if you're familiar with Clay Christensen at all, um, disruptive innovation is kind of his uh, sort of epiphanal theory um, and a number of different books, The Innovator's Solution, Innovator's Dilemma, over the years can evolve. This is a, uh, a new piece of work just came out in the last year or two with an eight-year-long study of looking at innovators and innovation in companies and what's really been kind of the catalyst, what defines innovation what defines innovators and what makes some of these companies different. That's really the first part and about the two th first two-thirds of the book and great read on the way home or your next plane ride or trip to Hawaii or wherever you're going. Um, the second part of it is really something around the, an innovation premium that is assigned to some of these companies that are differentiated and the market or others don't exactly know how to peg them. They're perceived as much more highly valuable than the intrinsic um, numbers would just tell you. And we're actually joined by uh, at least one of the companies on, on that uh, notable list. I've got the top 25 at the end of the presentation. But Intuitive Surgical is, is one of those. In fact, uh, top three. Salesforce is number one, interesting enough, where I currently work. Intuitive Surgical, number three. Um, and, uh, and so that's a little bit of kind of framing this. Now, my own background, again, not uh, I'm not one of the uh, the innovators uh, featured in, in the book and in the list by a long shot. It's generally uh, looked at as CEOs and leaders of these companies. But one of the things that um, is pretty clear is there's usually a diversity of backgrounds and experiences to these different folks. We'll talk about some of the traits. But in my own case, um, I said somewhat by design, uh, lots of different things that I've done over the years, as have most of you, as, as I kind of heard that. Different roles, different types of companies, different activities. So I've done marketing, operations, IT, um, business development, and the like. And I think through the course of that, and purposely also in a variety of different industries. Um, who was it that was mentioning the, um, what's in the chocolate milkshake? <laughs> it's also in the baby diaper? I actually made baby diapers for a while at uh, Kimberly Clark, so I am definitely not having chocolate milkshakes anymore uh, <laughs> after uh, after that experience. Um, uh, the uh, other, you know, more recent role uh, that I mentioned is when I joined uh, Harrah's after uh, a variety of these different things. I started off in IT as CIO, and then ultimately was asked, uh, in addition, to run our largest uh, operation or P&L, which is the gaming part of that business. Another great euphemism somebody used earlier, but gaming is the gambling part of the business and it's the thing that makes about 80% of the uh, revenue and um, pretty close to 90% of the profits in most of those um, uh, related companies. MGM, I think, slightly different. And then um, also as chief innovation officer for that. And uh, I'll talk you through at the tail end of this uh, my experiences as to what the heck does that even mean. You know, what is a chief innovation officer? What do you do? How do you do it? What are you sort of accountable for? But most importantly, and I think that's one of the things I want to leave with you today and make it pretty active, is what might you put in place to sort of drive and facilitate that innovation? Nelson's obviously doing some of that today and going to capture your ideas and some different things like that. But I'll talk to you about some of my own experiences and then a few things that we're doing today in my current role with Salesforce where we're actually um, launched a program called Ignite where we're working with leading companies, um, typically in the larger enterprise space, around how to drive innovation into their organization, set a vision, 
and actually bring some of the stuff to uh, to life. Now, the counter for me is um, I have done a number of startups, and there's a certain spot in my heart for any number of reasons. Some of you mentioned in the dot-com era or whatever you've been with startups and the passion. There's I actually jump back and forth between the two, and um, A, because I have a, a passion for it, but B, I actually find it really, really interesting. And um, I work in my current role at, at Salesforce largely with enterprise customers and some of the big monstrosities, uh, Sony, Hewlett Packard, uh, um, Medtronic, uh, DuPont, uh, a number of those. And at the same time, I'm on the board of two or three different companies. One's a small little game company called Doppel Games. We just uh, sold to a, a London-based company called Handmade. Um, Fisker Automotive, I also have a car passion I didn't mention, uh, so I did some advising and consulting, and I'm also an investor in uh, a really beautiful, very awesome, cool um, uh, hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid car company called Fisker Automotive that makes the Karma, and, uh, and a number of others out there. And again, the, the dichotomy of that for me is actually really interesting. There's t totally different kinds of problems and challenges and opportunities for both but I often, and my class, which I also teach uh, at UC Irvine, is about this idea of incumbents and insurgents. What is it about companies when they get to a certain size or scale or success that has a difficulty in continuing to evolve and innovate? And what is it about startups, or what we call insurgents, they're not always um, startups per se, but people who are kind of designed or their DNA is an insurgent, that allows them to stay innovative, hungry, um, continuously transform themselves, um, sometimes get out of even certain businesses and pursue aggressively into others. And it's that dichotomy that I think is really interesting, and um, that would be one of my big encouragements to you as you think about your own company, and hopefully we'll come away with a little bit of that today, is how do you act and feel a bit like an insurgent, a la maybe a startup or some of the other folks you do, and yet take advantage of some of the things that are really inherently good about established companies and big, um, bigger types of organizations and the like. And uh, a key punchline out of that, and I am, along with several of you, by the way, over dinner I was pretty intrigued, uh, I am a living example of a catalyst for trying to do that. And I think there is no role, and I mean this sincerely, in an organization that has the potential today to do that any better than a CIO or a CTO or somebody who has a great degree of business process and methodology and, uh, and architecture understanding and also can really understand the power of technology to help kind of drive and influence and continue to innovate. And I think that's really a, a key bit of the secret sauce. In fact, as we look at a number of the companies, um, they're not all technology companies. We tend to gravitate to, I mean, when I say most innovative companies in the world, you guys toss it out here for a second. What would be the first few that come to mind? Apple, Apple right? Who else? Google. Another? Salesforce. <laughs> Gave that one away, but <laughs> others? All three technology companies, right? We all kind of, I mean, you can argue Google's a media company or, or an informatics company or the like. Um, but that is where a lot of our perception around where innovation happens isn't around tech or tech companies. And certainly there's been huge market valuations just with Facebook and all that stuff going on today. But some of the most successful companies in the world, uh, I've had a chance to work with a few off and on over my career, Starbucks, right? Think about how innovative Starbucks has been and what's the phenomenon that's actually occurred with Starbucks when they've gotten their luster back. They grew like a weed. Yeah. Ran into some problems. What happened? Who came back? Howard Schultz came back. He's the founder. Dell. Yeah. Same deal. Uh, so you actually can start to then see, is there a difference around leadership and what's going on inside of a company that can significantly influence kind of the impact? And it's not only uh, technology companies. P&G, uh, uh, a, a number of them uh, ultimately out there. So. Uh, as I said, that's a bit of uh, uh, kind of my history. The other thing, as I said, the, the rule of threes. Again, I don't know that this is necessarily great advice, but this idea of being able to kind of blend two or three things together, keep them as, uh, this thing is a killer, relatively straight in your head, uh, and, and ultimately kind of be able to drive and, and merge those things together. And the combination of business sense or process and, and how uh, uh, business models and companies tick and how they work, 
a good handle around the technology itself, and then some sense of what could I do, what could I enable, what could I lead or drive that would help differentiate that company. And an understanding of what that business model, i.e. how does a company work, fundamentally how does it make money, but also what's the culture, the DNA, what are the key areas in a company that, um, that will fundamentally make a difference. Uh, in the CIO role, it's not always about uh, can I streamline and operationalize and make everything more efficiently. That's a key part of that role and job description, and we would all be quite familiar with that. But there are usually, back to the rule of threes, two to three pieces of a company that really make it tick. I'll give you an example. Um, Salesforce, where I'm at today, is a great products company, truly innovative on a number of things in a business model. But at the end of the day, what it's really good at, beyond those two, which is fundamental to its, its success, sales and marketing. And those are the areas, uh, if you're going to be involved in a company and figure out what's really going to drive uh, change and what the company is going to get behind and where you can really kind of make a big influence, those would be the three areas that you probably want to spend your time, your focus, your career, your energy and effort. In Harrah's, as an example, it is a fundamentally an operations driven company. It's in the hospitality business that happens to provide every darn thing you can imagine under the sun, like uh, MGM. Retail, food and beverage, uh, meetings and conventions, uh, all of these things. So clearly that's a big part of it. But it is also a games and gaming company. It is an entertainment in, in that sense. So uh, you pay to play as opposed to going to the movie theater where you pay your eight bucks, ten bucks in advance, or the other. So those two key areas are fundamental, but it was a marketing company as well. The difference, for those of you, I've not seen the movie, but it's a very close analogy. The strategy we pursued was Moneyball before Moneyball came out. What we thought was we could use data and analytics and customer um, behavior uh, analysis and trials and experimentation to massively influence um, the preference for our company, our products, and our brand vis-a-vis -vis competitors who tended to focus much more on the bricks and mortar. And that strategy and putting those kinds of things in place what were made all the difference. So I spent way disproportionate amount of my time not only doing or probably even de-emphasizing things I did on sourcing or procurement and sometimes even HR with 100,000 employees, it's not trivial, but it's really about driving marketing and innovation and business intelligence and decision science and the like. That's what was the big driver and differentiator on that. So technology, marketing, and operations were the three um, in that case. So I would encourage each of you to go back and do through the course of today or next few days and perhaps even as we advise Avatir, what are those two or three things in your business that really make it tick? And are you spending your time disproportionately, your time, by the way, and we'll come to this in a, uh, some um, uh, characteristics of these successful companies, your time on helping drive and even innovate in those areas directly and, of course, with your <clears throat> key partners that may be leading or driving those areas. Uh, and last but not least, tons and tons of different awards over there. So it's great to get external validation. But I would tell you, over the years of having done all that and winning these, the number one reason why I would ever choose to do or we would um, recognize these, got Global CIO of the Year and all that stuff, was about talent. This was the ability to actually recruit other people to our team, our goal, and our mission. People want to be associated with people doing amazing things. To think that a when I joined a billion dollar, 14 riverboat, one crappy casino in Las Vegas, which was a 1970s Holiday Inn that converted to Harrah's, could become a poster child for CRM and business intelligence and decision science and win all the kind of awards we did uh, is a pretty big deal. And you could not do that without great talent and a lot of other things you could bring to bear. So these kinds of activities become sort of self-fulfilling, but you have to go into it with a mindset of what am I trying to accomplish? And to do what we wanted to do, we had to have great people. Obviously a CEO who was a very bright guy. Uh, I was the exception to the whole rule. A marketing guy who was also an incredible uh, you know, direct marketer and very data-driven business intelligence, analytic, testing control kind of guy. 
and uh, obviously a number of other uh, folks, but that was probably the three kind of core roles, again, based on the, the types of things we were trying to accomplish and what made that company really tick to be able to move the needle. So that's the same kind of, again, advice and experience I would provide to you. So let me change gears for just a moment. How many of you are familiar with a hornea? Funny name, isn't it? What is a hornea? It's a deer. It's kind of like a reindeer. The interesting thing about a hornea, uh, it lives in uh, the Black Forest in Germany. And uh, starting about 10 years ago, um, conservationists and scientists and like began tagging lots of different animals. But this one stood out. So what you actually see here is graphs done by researchers of where the hornea lives and travels. Now, is there anything interesting about that? I'm sorry to stand in your old way here. Do you notice anything about where they don't go? So they're anti-communist uh, reindeer. Why does a hornea, a deer, not go over to the Czech Republic where there's great grass, nice things to eat, probably other, you know, things that are enjoyable. And why does a hornea not go to Czech Republic? There's great bars, you know, <laughs> in there. Good beer. Beautiful. Is there a mountain? No. It's all flat grassland. Uh, it's mostly forested, but it actually gets a bit more grassier, interestingly enough, in the Czech Republic. Are they hunted there? Potentially, um, although uh, I'm not a hunter, uh, and by and large my experience is animals usually aren't smart enough to figure out if they're walking into a place that gets hunted or not, but it's definitely a good, a good guess. The, 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 oh. check the, ch the check jackalope? The check jackalope? They eat the hornets. No. <laughs> Natural predator. They don't cross Natural predator. They don't cross observer. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the answer. Very possibly. It's those darn researchers. They're, uh... There was a fence there for something on the order of 40 to almost 50 years. It's gone now. When the Berlin Wall came down, the fence is gone. Why would the deer not go, oh, the fence is gone? Let's run across the uh, thing and eat all the nice grass over on the check side. Habit. Exactly right. So are behaviors learned or are they innate, I guess is the question. Is that just like when people come with cattle guards on a road? Uh-huh. Now they paint them on. Right. The cows still don't go across. Correct. <laughs> so the punchline of the short answer to this is it was obviously related to when the Berlin Wall and everything else came down and all the fencing came down. It is only today um, that they now track them, it was about uh, two years ago that this study came out, that you begin to see some minor adventuring across. Who do you expect is actually the ones that are making it across? Well, they actually almost always come back and, and sleep and rest on the other side. The young male deer. Man. Young male deer. It is ingrained upon them through, a uh, hornea live about 18 to 20 years. So for three, almost three generations, this was the environment they were used to. And they are only now in very small amounts with a new generation of deer beginning to to work across the virtual line. Even though a fundamental change happened, the behavior has become so ingrained that they have a difficult time moving across unless it's a new generation coming in that's beginning to explore and expound on that. One could predict that probably in another generation over the next you know, 15 to 20 years, this will probably change pretty radically. So what do we take away from that? Um, we're in the midst of a lot of change, yeah. right? Our, our world is changing around us in fundamental and increasingly faster and faster ways. 
Uh, we've all had a lot of fun, I'm pretty sure, over the last three years, particularly in your role as leading technology and IT, of dealing with the global shift, the change, the recession, uh, and the like. Um, how many of you now have responsibility or one of your key objectives is to figure out how to deal with globalization or internationalization thing, growth strategies of your company where you're now working in markets that um, are perhaps not core or historically familiar to you, and by the way, they're probably the most appealing or attractive in, in terms of growth, right? Um, Similarly, uh, there's been a whole shift around you know, driving greater efficiency, but also about resource conservation and being thoughtful about that and energy and the like. And then we have these very fundamental and very exciting changes going on in the techie world, right? Consumerization of technology, mobile, social, uh, these are all pretty dramatic changes. Um, how many of you are very active Facebookers? Looking around this crowd, I might predict three. Yeah? How many of your spouses are? And how many of your kids? A hornia. Uh, this is an area where uh, change is occurring, and we may not fully understand it. We may be fairly ingrained into some of the things we've historically been good at or focused on or dealing with and adopting and adapting and, and looking at that change probably requires us to get out of the box a little bit. In a heartbeat. Exactly. Which a lot of your employees are probably that way. Into the Facebook thing, they're past that now. Oh, absolutely. So now as, as our old folks, right, we're getting drugged into, the, into Facebook. The kids are moving on because they don't want to be there anymore. Now it's Twitter. You know, they're, they're yep. fully embracing Twitter now. Yep. Which really that age group hadn't. You start seeing them, they, they, they're actually starting to go further into the Czech Republic, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. How many of you use Tencent? Don't even know what it is. It's a number five on the uh, most <laughs> innovation high premium companies. China based company. You could think of it as kind of a PayPal in China. Um, but also a combination of Facebook, Twitter, and a little bit of PayPal going on. Chinese. Uh, Here's uh, another interesting deal. This is uh, S&P 500, which didn't exactly perform stellarly last year, but what's more interesting about it? 50 years ago, a typical company would stay on the S&P 500 for about 50 to 60 years. This last year, 22 companies dropped off, and 22 new companies, of course, take their place. What drives uh, S&P 500 is largely market cap of, of your company. Um, it's now uh, that about every two weeks a company is changing and falling out of the S&P 500. The average, so it went from about 50 or 60 years that a company would expect to probably stay on there to now the half-life is 18. And I would predict in the next five years it's going to be much more close to 10. Why is that? Why is that? Change is just happening so quickly. Business models are impacted through a variety of these different things, um, emerging economies, different technological shifts, and the like. So this pace of change is happening quite quickly, and different companies are moving in and disrupting with different business models, different mindsets, coming from different geographies, using different technologies um, to, to kind of streamline or improve their business process or model uh, in, at unprecedented change. This is kind of what's going on. And if you're a CEO and you're at a CEO forum or your board, you're looking at these pretty heavily and saying, you know, these are the challenges that we're trying to deal with. So you really got to kind of, a, you know, the, the enemy is at the gates, right? Interestingly, the enemy is quite often inside. It's the, the horny. It's the, it's the ability to not sort of identify changes happening and being able to kind of adapt and adopt and, and sort of um, press through that to be the, the young, the horny deer. It's okay. So we're definitely in a new space and kind of a new world, right? And, and kind of mapping and navigating through that maze is no trivial um, thing. I, I always like to... What, what, what would you say you do here? Look, I already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand that? What the hell is wrong with you people? Not dealing with change very well. Right? <laughs> and, you know, honestly, in, in a lot of roles, business roles and IT roles, you end up being very involved in sort of 
a lot of stuff that's important at the end of the day, but it's not necessarily driving the actual key outcomes and the innovations and stuff you do. So here's uh, something that uh, I get involved with increasingly a lot now, and I'm sure um, Nelson and others who have these kinds of exposure can do it. So if you're involved in a board or any senior management team or any level in a company, these are the topics that are around the table today, right? These ones we're all quite familiar with. Drive greater efficiency. Let's make sure operations are very, you know, always on, very effective, um, delivering the right stuff. Let's integrate the right stuff, whether it's technology or, you know, the new marketing programs in or making sure the, the numbers, you know, tie and we're pulling in the new company we just bought or merged and acquire. But on the flip side, um, this growth has really begun to take uh, a dominant seat at the table, right? Would you, you guys collectively agree? is that increasingly, again, it's been an interesting three years, this is now probably top of your agenda again. The, the CEO, the management team is saying, where are we going to grow? Where is it coming from? We have cut and cut and cut and cut, and obviously many of you are probably still figuring out how to take out more costs and get more efficient. Agility. How do we be more agile? How do we take advantage of these new markets, these opportunities? Um, where is innovation coming from? And is that do we need any more products? Is it adapting or moving into different channels, different markets? Is it the way we um, interact with our customers? Is it different partnerships and relationships we want to kind of do there? And then we have a couple of these technological um, kind of innovative things that are definitely on the key radar screen. Most boards, I mean, um, are much older than most of us sitting in this room. Don't get this stuff at all, right? We know GLC Starbucks just put a 27-year-old uh, social media maven on their board pretty dramatic, right, um, to, to help kind of understand exactly some of these things. They've always been kind of an innovator in a lot of things. Obviously, the mobility and other things are, are key areas that companies are shifting uh, greatly now. So this kind of leaves you with a bit of a paradox, in particularly in your roles as, as uh, what I affectionately refer to as um, CXOs. This is, in every board discussion, in every CEO that I get to work with, I just had a you know, sort of a heart-wrenching conversation with one I've gotten to know really well over the last couple of months around exactly this issue. He's built a billion-dollar company. He fully envisions. He has very clear plans of how he wants to take it to five billion. Team that's been with him, and he's you know evolved and changed that out over the last 15 years. The CIO just you know left this last week after a tough love conversation. He doesn't feel like. Even though he's done an amazing job, the CIO, he can't get him to the next level of where he wants to ultimately go. Even though uh, he did, a, I think, frankly, a pretty good job there, despite you know growth and everything going on, this is what this is what the expectation, or this is what the CEO, and frankly, his board. The original engagement I got here was one of the board members contacted me after a board meeting. We need help with somebody that can really help drive this vision. This is the last piece as we looked at how we go from here to here. This is what we need, somebody to help champion and drive that. And they set it up so that the existing CIO could maintain and focus and do this. He obviously didn't really love that relationship. He's gone and now kind of got to, this is going on kind of all over the place. And not to shock or awe anybody, but I would tell you that this is the thing. Now, when I engage, I work now with, you know, literally get to work with hundreds of different um, CXOs and CIOs around the world. Most of them are, when we get to work with some pretty progressive ones, but at the end of the day, you're still, many of you, focused on very important stuff and maybe pushing in an objective or two over here or maybe these new technologies and working with cool people like Avatir to help do that. But inspiring and empowering an organization and driving true agility leading the business perhaps into a couple of new areas that they don't really fundamentally understand and partnering up to do that. This is where the action is, and I think that's what um, the, the challenge you all have to think about, you know, how do you kind of um, move past that paradox and get there. Um, I'll refer to a couple of books. Here's one that I um, highly recommend. Uh, Jeannie Roth, Peter Wilde, done a phenomenal job here. I wish I'd have read this years ago. I would have probably been better uh, at what I uh, did. Um, but it really talks about not only the value that, that ultimately IT can bring, but where that actually comes from. Um, and this is the, one of the interesting parts of doing startup companies versus established companies. Just by the nature of being in startups, you're generally trying to get the block and the tackling done and the systems up and running. And most CIOs have come from this area, obviously have typically technical upbringing, and tend to get very focused and, um, I wouldn't say comfortable, because this is challenging as hell, but that's you know, the paradox side of the equation. The value 
when companies are really sophisticated, and there's a very small number that generally fall into this category of, of success, truly differentiated companies and businesses, they usually have pretty sophisticated processes. Think about a few of those. One you didn't mention earlier is Amazon. Bookseller, what's really ticking underneath there? You know, that's all about data and platforms and uh, customer insights and dynamic changes. Um, Zappos, similar deal. A, a differentiated experience around service that happened to sell shoes. Who picked them up? Amazon, for what reason? Just plugs really nicely into that whole kind of um, animal. So um, very useful and interesting to think about. This is the other challenge that's been out there. It's been talked about for years, but now the, tr the last three years, you've probably all been, whether you liked it or not, forced back into a little bit of the focused efficiency, operations effectiveness. You now got to push yourself to get back over into this quadrant of being differentiated, innovative, um, not only having the seat at the table, but probably not sitting there, definitely participating, but probably not even sitting there, but standing up and helping lead you know, a few of these key areas and, and drive the business forward. Critical. Not that it's going to be without challenges. So here's the good news, bad news. Um, there's never been more demand for what we all collectively do. You just kind of look at the, what's happening with the number of data and devices and profiles that you know have to get managed and the like. It's pretty stunning. Here's the bad news. That in and of itself requires some pretty innovative thinking and out of the box approaches, right? I, I, I don't know how many of you think you're actually going to grow your staff that much, you know, over the next few years. Um, so you're definitely having to kind of think of new and creative ways to, to ultimately handle that. So this idea of CXOs, and particularly CIOs being innovation catalysts is, is key. So um, to your reading or your new assignment, um, what can you learn from other innovators? This is a learned skill, just like a hornea. It's not necessarily that you're going to wake up one morning and go, the Czech Republic looks awesome, and I'm going to go over there and be a really successful deer in a, in a new neighborhood. Um, so what can we kind of learn from, uh, from this? And so there's a whole solution or set of readings and different things that um, are, are out there. Um, and, you know, we look at different uh, approaches in, in my class and with a number of different folks around, you know, different models and Lots of uh, organizations, particularly in tech companies, but now increasingly are doing, you know, hackathons and different kinds of things like this to stimulate innovation and get teams motivated and excited. And, uh, you know, Google started the, you know, the 20%, you know, work time uh, kind of time innovation deal. All very successful um, kinds of things. And there are also great companies and models you can work with out there. So uh, IDEO, for those of you not familiar, San Francisco-based, phenomenal company that really helps you think about not so much technology, they're not really a technology company at all, but they really think about the customer experience historically, whether that's product or service delivery or a whole number of different things. Um, and they've got some tools. Uh, we have a product called Idea Exchange that helps you kind of manage these ideas and facilitate them and vote on them and let people get exposure. IDEO's got a great one called Open IDEO that really puts it out into a crowdsourcing model of not only what are great ideas, but how to actually test those and validate them and get a lot of other different brains and things kind of thinking about your uh, your approach. Idea Lab and Innocentive and a number of these. And hanging out, um, as I said before, one of the things I do with startup companies in a diverse range of them. So the ones I'm involved with are in healthcare, automotive, uh, tech, augmented reality, and the like. You get a variety of different exposures to different things from these companies, and that's a, a key element that we'll talk about in, a, in just a moment. So this model of how do you drive innovation into companies or be an innovator is non-trivial at best. It's particularly hard in established companies. Very difficult, right? Um, you've got a great team, you can, and you're pretty engaged. I can also tell that pretty quickly, right? Um, that is one of the defining factors of successful and innovative companies, by the way, um, as we'll see here in, in a moment in the survey. But, of all the companies, most CEOs when interviewed in management teams will say it's their job to help facilitate innovation. The really successful ones, think about those CEOs, they're doing it. They're in your knickers driving it all day, right? So you mentioned Apple. What do we all think about Steve Jobs, right? Some behaviors that maybe not always the most fun to be around, but tenaciously focused on in a product. 
Mark Benioff is that way as well. He is in the midst driving and, you know, stimulating and pushing and prodding. Jeff Be Bezos, huge experimenter, very much asking the why and the how. You think of Piero Madar and, and originally Meg Ryan in the eBay space, also kind of pushing and challenging Howard Schultz and Starbucks, you know, from the original whiff of coffee walking around in, in, uh, in Italy to really driving that. And then again, you look at some of these founders that have left and then come back and you can see the pre, before, and after. Jobs being probably the most, you know, ultimate example of that, but Schultz and uh, Michael Dell and a number of others. So some of the, uh, those characteristics um, and, and um, approaches uh, are featured heavily in the book. So obviously in the short amount of time we have, I'm not going to be able to kind of go through all that. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with three of them. Um, and again, uh, they were certainly probably more the innovator than I ever was. But what you can do and how you kind of facilitate and drive that organization. So David Nealman of JetBlue originally, who's now running Azul, serial airline startup. Horrible business, by the way. Horrible. Um, quite successful. <laughs> but ultimately gets booted out, you know, after usually about five or six years in, in doing it, and then kind of goes off to his next one. Benioff and then uh, um, Howard Schultz, I didn't mention, but my very first real job was actually working at Starbucks when there were four. Um, and Howard came in and bought the company, and it was a fascinating ride, and thank God, because I you know, later got to pay for grad school and all that stuff as a result. Um, and I was literally making coffee and a barista and nothing fancy or exciting, but just to kind of watch and be that whole phenomenon of what had occurred and, and continue to see it is, is a huge deal. Um, so there's a mission with most of these companies. Nelson, you know, one of the things that might be interesting to hear you know, from you through the course of this, these Founder-led, typically, are these very uh, um, successful leaders. Tata, in the Tata Nan, I don't know if you all have looked at, at that and how difficult and, and the example of what he went through to kind of come up with re-engineering a car, not just to make it small and cheap, but to completely fit in the model of how it would work and be sold and distributed and who would buy it and why in India is pretty fascinating. They all have this kind of overarching mission. So Steve, of course, the most famous, but he wants to put a ding in the universe. Um, almost all of these, you know, Mark, um, one of the things that's defining about Salesforce that you don't hear as much about is a model called 111 that he created um, and has been adopted by Google and a number of other companies. But 1% of all employees' time, 1% of product, and 1% of all profits gets plowed back into um, uh, 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 nonprofit organizations. It is vehicle to do good by being successful and vice versa. It's, it's this pretty fascinating kind of deal. That's what really ultimately drives him at the end of the day. He's a masterful marketer and sales guy and technologist, but he's also trying to do good um, in the world and it makes it um, kind of you know, uniquely compelling. There are five characteristics. I'm gonna quickly surf through them in the, in the time we have here, but, but challenge you to go back and think about these in, in the next little bit of discussion here. One of them. Yeah, we'll say this again. Good. So one of them is of, of all of these five, four are learnable and differentiated and distinctive. One is learnable, but probably has a little bit more of an innate characteristic, and it's the one that's first called associating. But the four behaviors that are really critical as they've evaluated all of these different companies, hundred, they've actually talked thousands of companies and executives and looked at the results and everything else. But in the key hundred, again, lots of CAOs and, and stuff, as you read it, you'll see four key areas that are really critical um, and that most of these folks score very highly in. Questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. And then the associating is about taking disparate things and linking them together in interesting, creative ways. How many of you have ever read the Medici or Medici uh, uh, effect? Um, you ever heard of the book? It basically, uh, it's come out a couple of different times, but the back in the era of uh, the Venetians and in Italy when the Renaissance era occurred, they brought in tons of different artists and creative and scientists and the like and put them all in one area. And it was the explosion of the Renaissance era that really came from that by having all of these different disciplines and different folks living and working and interacting together came one of the most um, creative and amazing times through the course of history and for art and science and everything else. It's this concept of associating 
sometimes disparate or seemingly unrelated things or experiences or people in combination with these four other behaviors that turns out to be largely the secret sauce of the truly innovative companies and the leaders associated with doing them. Um, so the question is, are you born with this ability? Is it an Ahornia situation? Lauren, what do you think? Are all these, was Steve Jobs' destiny to pretty much be the way he was? You can't answer. <laughs> the answer is, you're not born this way. Not necessarily. <laughs> Uh, the good news is that in at least those four key areas, very much learnable. The first one, as I said, has a dose of kind of an innate deal, but probably can be facilitated or, or exacerbated in positive ways over time by your life's experiences, the type of work you do, parenting, where you grew up, the type of activities you do, the people you hang out with. Um, so it's not really genetic, just like in the Ahornia's case. It is a learned behavior that when you do something for a long period of time, you get, tend to be better at it. Um, it's certainly facilitated, as I said, by certain cultures. One of the things that when we look at innovation and why is it disproportionately American, if we still have one thing we can really kind of hang our hat on in this company, or I'm sorry, in this country, it is this. But it's in part due to the culture and the environment. We're sitting up here in Napa, obviously, near Silicon Valley. It's the epicenter of that kind of environment and culture. And every time I'm here, every time, my energy level goes up crazily. When I'm in the city, you look at it, all the people and friends I have, and everybody's working on this and this next new thing. I mean, it just, so being in that environment cranks it up. And you're around people with ideas, and failure is not really a failure here. It's a learning, you know, and, and it's, it's a really dynamic kind of environment. Um, and there's this sense of, you know, having to be able to challenge the status quo, um, putting a ding in the universe, right? These are characteristics that if you find kind of what that passion is, what the focus is, if you love your business, I love your business, right? It's phenomenal. And you talked about this last night. You want to expound on that a little bit? What's really awesome about what you do? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it goes to say I look forward to getting up every morning one minute ago. I've not had a day where I've not wanted to go in unless I've been physically sick. I really look at what we do for people. It, it, yeah, the money's there. It's great. It's why you do VC, but you don't do VC for the money. You do VC on the chance that you make the next new product that might save somebody, might make a difference in the world, might be the new Apple, right? And that's that's what we do. We do that every day, and and, it, and it's great. It's absolutely phenomenal. And You've done it how long? I, I've been with startups in medical device manufacturing for. My past four jobs, I mean, pretty much my four main jobs that I've been at. So. If they cut your pay and you got almost nothing next year, would you I'd, probably I'd, still I'd do it? Half the business. I'd be half the business. That makes a fundamental yeah. difference, right? Yeah. Given that it'd be tough to live, but. Of course. <laughs> but fortunately, you've been in a stock over the last few years with uh, <laughs> ISO. Can't buy gas. <laughs> True. Just cash out. So the real key is it, it does, uh, you know, obviously start with you. So the four behaviors a little bit, let's talk about this. Questioning. Questioning, questioning. How many of you on a day-to-day -day basis, you probably berate your staff pretty heavily if I was a, a betting person. How many of you really focus on questioning some of the fundamentals of your business, your market, your customers, your products, the way you deliver service? Can you think of a couple good examples? Anybody got that one? When's the last time you woke up and said, why in the hell do we sell through distributors? Go direct. Why do we not target, you know, young male slot players? Because they don't play slots, right? Not necessarily. Today's, no. How many times do you sort of question? This is what has really defined a lot of these kind of key leaders and innovators. Um, think different, right, in the, in the Apple sort of mode. I mean, again, you'll read in the story, but one of the original defining moments of so many in Steve's and, and Apple's career, by the way, I remember he got fired from Apple, came back, learned a ton from Pixar, and obviously Next, and that really was what drove the, uh, the outcome of iPods and things like that. But he wanted a computer that didn't have a noisy fan in it. Who cares? I mean, 
every computer had a big old noisy fan. Most PCs still do today. They get hotter than hell and fans blowing like crazy. That little things like that, challenging that, fundamentally ends up with different designs and you know obviously that's percolated all the way through. If you're not challenging and questioning certain parts of your business, right? What's part of the problem with this? You got the seat at the table. If you're starting to question everything, do you come off as some sort of challenging naysayer, don't know it all? Yeah. So you arguably you have to kind of pick your areas or battles, but we'll talk about some different uh, areas that can probably help you do that. Second big category is observing. How many of you, I, I've, so again, I, I try not to use myself as a, a great example here, but I am a professional people watcher. Everybody loves to watch people. I love to watch people. I'm pretty good at watching people. And you can watch and observe so many things. How many of you watch processes or components or people in your business? What's a TV show now that the, the, the mystery boss or the undercover boss? Phenomenal, isn't it? I still don't know how they get away with all the employees not going, why is this whole camera crew behind us, right? <laughs> I don't know that's the boss. <laughs> Must be really tiny cameras. but. Um, Observing customers, observing people who work in your business on the front lines, spending time down there. I mean, I know this is hard. You're all super busy. Doing a customer transaction, observing what they do. I had a fascinating experience, Chris, and I'll share this with you. I um, had to go get a haircut a couple weeks ago. I always forget about them, so it was long overdue. And uh, place I go, great lady, but it's mostly you know women in there, and they are talking about two things that were amazing to me. Cosmopolitan and um, Words with Friends. This is what women spend their time now doing. Words with Friends. It is, and again, the data will show if you spend any time looking at Zinger or whatever, Words with Friends is dominatingly successful with a female target market, which is, by the way, um, Chris and I have similar backgrounds in the gaming industry, this has historically been the category that we kill it in um, the gaming industry, with slot machines in particular. Not middle age, 30, but particularly 40 to about 60 year old women. They're all playing words with friends and now hanging with friends and the like. Huge. So sitting and listening to them, and then they're also talking about, when I go to Vegas, this and that and the other, Cosmopolitan, 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 Cosmopolitan. Boom. Score. Um, this kind of observational sort of activity, um, given I still have some activity and things involved there, very insightful, picking up and observing that. Going to the places where you work or your customers hang out or your employees hang out and listening and watching and observing will give you great insights of some problems that you can solve. The other thing is that uh, over the years, uh, pulling some of these people in and having them part of your network or your solution, which we'll talk about next, is key. So networking is the other one. Interesting things about networking. We're all here, arguably, for a number of reasons, uh, to help Nelson and the team out here at Avatir and give provider advice. But part of the benefit of these is networking and sharing of ideas and the like. But what's different about networking for innovators than it is for the rest of us? Any thoughts? When you network as an innovator, is the composition of that any different than this meeting? Other things you might do? Hanging out at the golf club or the um, hiking or whatever else you might do? Brainstorming, challenge, lifting. You're generally hanging out with people you wouldn't necessarily hang out with. Most people in a networking model are looking for people who are more similar to themselves, have similar challenges and problems. Maybe they're kind of networking for potential career growth or opportunities or they're, you know, it could be venture or funding or things like that. The people who are really successful at um, innovating are generally hanging out with people that are totally different than them that bring different perspectives to it. Uh, again, the, the Medici effect. Um, an example, so in some of the startups that I actually work with, one of the guys, um, Brett Bushnell, is the son of Nolan Bushnell who created Atari and then Chuck E. Cheese and then a couple others after that. Brent, I would argue, does have his dad's DNA and all that. But when I go hang out with Brent, I'm an investor in one of his companies, the one that just sold called Doppel Games, Brent hangs out with some of the most interesting people I would never generally sort of come across. Artists, poets. Um, he turned uh, a number of these different innovative things he's doing 
into a thing called Sin Labs, and Sin Labs got picked up by a TV show that uh, is the um, the makeover one, um, and he's the guy that would come in and do all the crazy technology and different interactive stuff for that. So by following his passion and kind of what he's doing, he's the guy that gets tapped into that. I actually love hanging out and with Brent. He's just kind of kooky and crazy, but this is his network. Benioff is very much like this. Um, most of these entrepreneurs have very eclectic networks. For those of you who work a lot with CEOs, you're always having to deal with FOCs, right? Friend of the CEO. <laughs> Mark's uh, folks consist of um, artists, you know, Neil Young, um, you know, startup founders, uh, people that uh, are in the medical profession, um, great research physicians and doctors. He has this amazing network, and this is where he spends his time. He invites him to his house. He's doing different activities. And he plays around Hawaii, invites people over to spend, flies around with them on his jet, all those things that a you know, wealthy CEO can do. But it's that set of networking and the ideas that come out of that. He pivoted the company, which was arguably the inventor of the SaaS model and all that, um, to this whole social enterprise and launched Chatter and all that based on a lot of that input, both from employees, some particularly young ones, very hip on the whole social media thing, and a lot of these external influences. We bring the founders of Dropbox and um, uh, social uh, um, uh, foundational kind of give back companies into the company, uh, world class doctors. This is a normal part of company meetings. Tony Robbins, you know, that kind of stuff is, is part of what kind of goes on. If you are not hanging out with people different than yourselves and are not looking at different angles and problems. These are valuable, but that's where real innovation comes from. And then last but not least in this category is experimentation. Uh, this is kind of uh, probably arguably one of the most difficult. If you saw the chart, if most people were strong in all these categories of real innovators, this was the one that was sort of a key differentiator. Some of the ones featured up there, less so in this. The ones that are exceptionally good, you mentioned some of the companies, Google, Amazon, these are by their nature experimental companies. They're constantly running behind the scenes these experiments with customers. If I show them this versus this, what is the outcome I get? Do they like this better or this better? This better or this better? Let's try this, try this, try this, constantly doing it. Everything's always in beta at Google, right? Um, that kind of experimental model tells you much more about what the future looks like than the past, which is what most things around best practices are, uh, um, networks of, you know, how did you solve this problem and the like. Experimentation helps you do a much better job of saying, here's what I think, I'm going to put it to test and kind of plot the future as a result. And this is what um, leading companies generally become very successful at doing. Lots of trials. Failure is good, in fact desirable in a lot of cases because every time you fail, you learn what didn't work and you refine it and iterate on it to keep pushing forward. That's the key. So from uh, your own encouragement, you know, again, uh, I'll show you examples of some things that, that we've done here. Just try different stuff. Experiment with it. If you don't get the sort of exposure, um, you're, you're not going to do that. Hang out with companies that do much more experimentation. Um, uh, pilot projects. You know, this is, again, IT in particular does a lot of POCs, proof of concepts, projects. Um, and, and, but are you really doing experiments? My experience is even when you go to Agile, it's all about just getting projects kind of done faster. Usually the risk factor of failure in IT and in the business, by the way, is high. Are you putting a process and a team or a methodology in place that allows you to actually proof of concept and pilot these things very rapidly and fail? but learn from that and kind of keep going forward in addition to or in, or in conjunction with the kind of traditional project management or methodology that, that you ultimately have. So we said, now last but not least, it's the first on the list, but this is the really the secret sauce to kind of how you bring it together, and that's the concept of associational thinking. This idea of, uh, uh, this is a great quote from Steve Jobs. Um, Mark Vanioff has a slightly less elegant version of this, and it sometimes embarrasses me when he hears it, but he's like, we copy everything from everybody else. Mark says that blatantly. It's actually not really true, and I'm not sure sometimes why he does it, but it's exactly, he's saying that, oops, sorry, cut off. Creativity is the, the connecting of things. And that's it. It's that associating of this and that 
you know, the idea of chatter was, you know, quote unquote Facebook slash Twitter for the enterprise, right? Um, those kinds of associations and how do you apply that to a different context. The original premise of the company is why can't all business software be as easy to use as Amazon.com? Why do I have to install anything? Why can't I just go on there and see it and see ratings and reviews and all of that sort of stuff? That's the kind of associational thinking that, that um, um, successful posts do. It. So what you want to kind of, again, if you're hanging out with the right folks, looking at the right things, combine odd combinations of things together. Put people on your team that don't come from the typical model. Associate yourself with organizations that may challenge your thinking or give you different insights or learnings. Hire firms that are not your typical kind of firms to work with. A lot of ideas are pretty expensive, but there are lots of other folks that are kind of creative and nimble and, and challenge um, different things. Connect different dots. You know, look at these things, tie different opportunities together, you know, why aren't we doing slot machines for young males? Well, what other things are they doing? Activision's killing in that market. What is it about those games versus our games that's that's different? Um, achievement and, you know, different things like that. How do you put those two together and actually come up with something that might work? And I've ultimately done that. So the, go back and challenge yourself of which of these behaviors ultimately, as you read in the book, could you improve upon Arguably all of them. None of us are terribly successful at all of these. But a little dose of all of these and perhaps staking out as you set your other goals, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit on some experimentation. I'm going to push the envelope a little bit on better observing. I'm going to spend my one day a week or my half a day a week walking the floor or, you know, engaging with customers or um, going to competitors. You know, what are they really doing or what are their customers ultimately saying? And then lastly, how do you actually put this into action? Um, how do you instigate and sort of drive this forward? Um, a few perhaps colorful things here. The first one uh, alludes to a concept called beginner's mind. Are you all familiar with this? If you're into Zen or, or uh, that sort of thing. Beginner's mind basically says, look at it as if you have no sense of boundaries, no context of why it is the way it is. Really understand and explore and try to think about it kind of completely fresh, the beginner's mind. Better Mousetrap is really about this idea of kind of assembling different things together, experiment a little bit, understand changing this for that and what happens and how would I kind of do this and make it as more effective or interesting. Managing chaos is a huge part of it. You have to, there is a different side of all of you. I know it's there because I've worked with so many of you and uh, folks like us over the years. There is a creative side. There's a reason you sort of got into this career field to begin with, to create stuff and do cool things. Get comfortable managing that chaos. Um, and set up a structure where you can do the must-dos, you can do the left side of the paradox, but you keep pushing and challenging yourself into the right side of the innovation and the grit. When you find the stuff that works or that really ticks in your company, more cowbell. You guys all familiar with more cowbell? More cowbell. <laughs> so in an iterative kind of model, you figure out, I might have been, you know, most ideas are 60 to 80 percent of some goodness there, but you're not quite sure what's the right 60 or 80 percent. So we would tend to run the experiments with two or three sort of factors in there that you're trying to solve for. And then in an iterative model, you go, well, more of this and a little bit less of that, turn this dial, more cowbell. And when you figure those out, then you kind of keep driving it forward. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but then you start to really coalesce around what's the essence of that. And it's often not quite where you were shooting for. And it's that idea of, of more cowbell. And then lastly is the Zen master, when you figure out what that critical element or that cool thing could be, that's when you get really, you know, focused. That's when you get really jobs on it and say, how do I sort of navigate this forward and drive it through and, and do that um, through a number of different ways. I'm going to give you an example, sorry on the time thing here, of one we just worked with this last year, KLM. Social media, right? Most of you are not very familiar with this. Here's an example of how they figured out from a ground zero start, what the hell to do with it. Be delivered like a message in a social media bottle to unsuspecting travelers at one of the world's busiest airports and make a likable airline even more likable? We were curious to find out. Welcome to KLM Surprise. Armed with our social media toolkit, our little experiment began. First job, Find KLM passengers who were checked into their flight via one of KLM's four square locations or left a message through Twitter. Second job, 
Search their social profiles. Get to know them as well as you can. To think of a personalized gift. Dat zijn heel sportief iemand is en een weekend Rome gaat doen. Ja, die is het misschien leuk als we haar zo'n Nike Plus uh, bandje geven. Nothing fancy, like a house or a sports car. Just small stuff. Carry on size stuff. Third job, hunt them down and deliver the gift. 100% zei je dat het er is. Want ik kreeg net een bericht, denk ik. Goedemiddag. Je liet uh, ons weten, je hebt Twitter, ja. dat je met ons reist vandaag. Ja. Dus we hebben een kleinigheidje voor je gekocht. Nou, leuk. Hartstikke ja, leuk. Hoi. 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 Dag. Tim, je hebt uh, laten weten dat je met ons vliegt vandaag naar Washington. Ja, dat klopt. Dus we willen je verrassen met iets, uh, nou, een, kleine, een kleine aardigheid. Dus dat is een goed bon uh, voor je, van 50 euro. Oh, even ze daar nodig. Dat is leuk, dankjewel. After several weeks of handing out little gifts, a few things became apparent. In the age of social media, doing something that creates a real smile on somebody's face is much cooler than attaching a smiley face. But most importantly, it seemed that indeed an airline could use social media to both surprise and make a small difference to a passenger's day. And we're not just guessing, we know, because they told us, and their friends, massively. <laughs> Oh, in three weeks. So since then, they've lost a massive program around this, and they're engaging with customers in a variety of different models and methods in this. And it all started from uh, some of these experiments that were run last June and, and July um, in, in uh, Schiphol in uh, Amsterdam. And that spawned a huge set of initiatives that are now um, taking off in and around all over the company. And it started off as a very small thing. So let me kind of wrap with this. Um, I'm going to skip past, you know, sort of my own experience here in, in very quick format, but you know, in your role, you don't have to be a chief innovation officer to sort of set the goal and objectives. This is kind of what it looked like for me. As you were anointed with this crazy, ridiculous title and role of what the hell do you do, you got to sort of say, okay, what am I trying to accomplish? So just set out a basic set of goals and objectives. For us, uh, you know, we took this company, or we're planning on taking it private, and so the goal was to bring it back out, as just happened a couple weeks ago here, um, and really increase that valuation multiple significantly drive, you know, revenue or, or, or value or profit. Um, and then we really wanted to make sure that we were instilling this acceleration of, a, of an innovation kind of leadership. Broke out some categories and some key initiatives and things we were doing. Again, you can apply some good, you know, IT methodology and, and uh, logic to that. Here's an area that not too many people fully, um, I think, understand or appreciate. Um, not necessarily best practice, but it worked for us, is I define vectors. Again, trying to keep it relatively simple. Six vectors. Innovation is a funny thing. A, you don't own it. It has to come from a lot of different things, as, as we all know. But you want to kind of say, here's areas where I'd like to over-focus or, or guide. And then you're also communicating out as you put your partners and everybody else in place. Here's the areas. This is the kind of amazingly crazy cool things I think I'm trying to solve. I don't even know all the answers. But, you know, around interactive CRM and smart service and how that could be fundamentally differentiating for us and, the, you know, the game experience I was just talking about and expanding channels and how we monetize those differently. And then bring in some different partners and some tools. So you're going to use one today. Um, we had a combination of stuff from IDEO and then this thing called Ideas that we used from Salesforce that was pretty awesome to help us kind of capture that and identify. But more important than that, this is really the secret sauce. It is, um, I'm boring you with the PowerPoint and I apologize, but creating and letting people visualize and touch and experience the stuff fundamentally makes the difference. So as we kind of put our plan together, we created 65 different experiences. And when we had a big senior management meeting come out, it wasn't showing these videos and things like that you see here. We actually had them live. And sometimes it was mocked up and there's man behind the curtain and crazy stuff that people would walk through. You'd have an experience. You play the game. We worked with a lot of different vendors to kind of say, bring your craziest stuff and let's put it out there. And then we had a theme behind this that was tying it all together and kind of bringing it to life. And that really helps people get it and drive these initiatives forward. 
and be part, part of them and participate um, and the like. And one of the things I would again share with you, and again, I haven't purposely done anything on the, the Salesforce side, what I found was one of the most compelling things was to use a platform to help drive this innovation. And I don't just mean the tool to capture ideas. One of the things about this cloud stuff uh, that I've been mucking with for years was we could take this platform and use that as the mechanism to drive business processes and all this new data that we would need to capture and create the customer experience and the analytics off the grid. Um, and very agilely and very quickly to, to do that, very inexpensively. And so that was at the core, and then we come up with all the ideas, and you're like, well, quickly stitch it here, throw some data over into this thing, do a little bit of workflow here, little man behind the mirror in this area, and you could get these live human trials out fairly quickly, and then you actually had a spot to, to put the information and manage it and the like. And ultimately, we had a good um, experience. So my point to you is, back to the paradox. Um, I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't do... <laughs> And you can't be incredibly successful at the left side of the equation, right? You've got to do an amazing world-class job at your, your primary role as a CXO. But there are some ways that you can kind of push yourself, processes, people, um, methods to kind of push over into the other side and, and really drive kind of that innovation thing. So, um, I'll kind of stop at, at that point, given we've got a, a fair bit of time. Um, I'm going to just poke you through at the end here, and then um, questions or have a discussion around it. Um, you know, I won't go through the methodology and stuff that we've kind of created about how to do that. Um, but for those of you who are interested in the innovation premium, um, here's a few of the companies that are that are ultimately out there. I'll make this stuff available to you. So the idea behind the innovation premium uh, is interesting. <clears throat> There's one, I think, kind of minor little flaw with it, which is generally has to be public companies or ones that they can get an update on the financials. But it looks at what is the value of the company um, from an NPV and a cash flow example when they can run all the models against it and say, by and large, here's what the value of that company should be over a five-year looking forward basis. When investors have a premium, a disproportionate premium on that, that's a big thing of what's called drives the innovation premium. So when you look at certain companies, um, obviously Salesforce up here is big, the expectation is disruptive, and it has been for um, its whole history, and you arguably haven't seen anything yet in terms of what the potential is and the size of that market that's been created and how they can continue to capture and dominate that going forward. Amazon, similar. Our good friends at Intuitive Surgical, um, great company. I am a customer <laughs> and a stockholder, and uh, and I think it's amazing what the potential of this is, obviously, to you as well. Tencent, I mentioned, uh, definitely a company worth probably checking out, whether you're in the investing side or uh, just uh, somebody to kind of look at what's happening. And this is the innovation from the, quote, bottom of the pyramid. It does not all come from this country. It does not all come from the kind of areas. There's some huge markets and things out there. And then obviously the top five. There's the whole 25 are in here, and happy to share with That's you. But, but Apple is uh, is um, is in there as well. So with that, this is wonderful. Thank you very much. Very good.